Hi there, and welcome back. I think you're doing one of the greatest things in the world, listening to the truth of God's Word. Today, on day number 18, we read Genesis 31, Job 18, and Mark 11. May the Lord bless you real good today. Yesterday, we heard of the rivalry between Rachel and Leah, and about more sons for Jacob. And all of those sons have names with meanings appropriate to what Rachel or Leah were feeling at the time. Genesis 31 But Jacob soon learned that Laban's sons were grumbling about him. Jacob has robbed our father of everything, they said. He has gained all his wealth at our father's expense. And Jacob began to notice a change in Laban's attitude toward him. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. So Jacob called Rachel and Leah out to the field where he was watching his flock. He said to them, I have noticed that your father's attitude toward me has changed. But the God of my father has been with me. You know how hard I have worked for your father, but he has cheated me, changing my wages ten times. But God has not allowed him to do me any harm. For if he said, The speckled animals will be your wages, the whole flock began to produce speckled young. And when he changed his mind and said, The striped animals will be your wages, then the whole flock produced striped young. In this way, God has taken your father's animals and given them to me. One time during the mating season, I had a dream, and I saw that the male goats mating with the females were streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then in my dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob! And I replied, Yes, here I am. The angel said, Look up, and you will see that only the streaked and speckled and spotted males are mating with the females of your flock. For I have seen how Laban has treated you. I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready and leave this country and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah responded, That's fine with us. We won't inherit any of our father's wealth anyways. He has reduced our rights to those of foreign women. And after he sold us, he wasted the money you paid him for us. All the wealth God has given you from our father legally belongs to us and our children. So go ahead and do whatever God has told you. So Jacob put his wives and children on camels, and he drove all his livestock in front of him. He packed all the belongings he had acquired in Padan Aram and set out for the land of Canaan, where his father Isaac lived. At the time they left, Laban was some distance away, shearing his sheep. Rachel stole her father's household idols and took them with her. Jacob outwitted Laban the Aramean, for they set out secretly and never told Laban they were leaving. So Jacob took all his possessions with him and crossed the Euphrates River, heading for the hill country of Gilead. Three days later, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he gathered a group of his relatives and set out in hot pursuit. He caught up with Jacob seven days later in the hill country of Gilead. But the previous night God had appeared to Laban the Aramean in a dream and told him, I am warning you. Leave Jacob alone. Laban caught up with Jacob as he camped in the hill country of Gilead. What do you mean by deceiving me like this? Laban demanded. How dare you drag my daughters away like prisoners of war? Why did you slip away secretly? Why did you deceive me? And why didn't you say you wanted to leave? I would have given you a farewell feast with singing and music accompanied by tambourines and harps. Why didn't you let me kiss my daughters and grandchildren and tell them goodbye? You have acted very foolishly. I could destroy you. But the God of your father appeared to me last night and warned me, Leave Jacob alone. 
I can understand your feeling that you must go and your intense longing for your father's home. But why have you stolen my gods? I rushed away because I was afraid. I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. But as for your gods, see if you can find them and let the person who has taken them die. And if you find anything else that belongs to you, identify it before all these relatives of ours, and I will give it back. But Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the household gods. Laban went first into Jacob's tent to search there, then into Leah's, and then the tents of the two servant wives, but he found nothing. Finally he went into Rachel's tent. But Rachel had taken the household idols and hidden them in her camel saddle, and now she was sitting on them. When Laban had thoroughly searched her tent without finding them, she said to her father, Please, sir, forgive me if I don't get up for you. I'm having my monthly period. So Laban continued his search, but he could not find the household idols. Then Jacob became very angry, and he challenged Laban. What's my crime? What have I done wrong that you chase after me as though I were a criminal? You have rummaged through everything I own. Now show me what you have found that belongs to you. Go on, set it out here in front of us before our relatives for all to see. Let them judge between us. For twenty years I have been with you, caring for your flocks. In all that time your sheep and goats never miscarried. In all those years I never used a single ram of yours for food. If any were attacked and killed by wild animals, I never showed you the carcass and asked you to reduce the count of your flock. No, I took the loss myself. You made me pay for every stolen animal, whether it was taken in broad daylight or in the dark of night. I worked for you through the scorching heat of the day and through the cold and sleepless nights. Yes, for twenty years I slaved in your house. I worked for fourteen years earning your two daughters and then six more years for your flock. And you changed my wages ten times. In fact, if the God of my father had not been on my side, the God of Abraham and the fearsome God of Isaac, You would have sent me away empty-handed, but God has seen your abuse and my hard work. That is why he appeared to you last night and rebuked you. Then Laban replied to Jacob, These women are my daughters. These children are my grandchildren. And these flocks are my flocks. In fact, everything you see is mine. But what can I do now about my daughters and their children? So come, let's make a covenant, you and I, and it will be a witness to our commitment. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a monument. Then he told his family members, Gather some stones. So they gathered stones and piled them in a heap. Then Jacob and Laban sat down beside the pile of stones to eat a covenant meal. To commemorate the event, Laban called the place Jeger Sahadutha, which means witness pile in Aramaic. And Jacob called it Gale'ed, which means witness pile in Hebrew. Then Laban declared, This pile of stones will stand as a witness to remind us of the covenant we have made today. This explains why it is called Gale'ed, witness pile but it was also called Mizpah, which means watchtower. For Laban said, May the Lord keep watch between us to make sure that we keep this covenant when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or if you marry other wives, God will see it even if no one else does. He is a witness to this covenant between us. See this pile of stones And see this monument I have set between us. They stand between us as a witness of our vows. I will never pass this pile of stones to harm you, and you must never pass these stones or this monument to harm me. I call on the God of our ancestors, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of my grandfather Nahor, to serve as a judge between us. So Jacob took an oath before the fearsome God of his father Isaac to respect the boundary line. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice to God there on the mountain and invited everyone to a covenant feast. 
After they had eaten, they spent the night on the mountain. Laban got up early the next morning, and he kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. In yesterday's reading in Job, Job again complained that he was surrounded by mockers, and despairingly again said, My hope will go down with me to the grave. Once again, the part of Bildad the Shuhite will be read by my son-in-law, Brandon Bond. Job 18 Then Bildad the Shuhite replied, How long before you stop talking? Speak sense if you want us to answer. Do you think we are mere animals? Do you think we are stupid? You may tear out your hair in anger, but will that destroy the earth? Will it make the rocks tremble? Surely the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. The sparks of their fire will not glow. The light in their tent will grow dark. The lamp hanging above them will be quenched. The confident stride of the wicked will be shortened. Their own schemes will be their downfall. The wicked walk into a net. They fall into a pit. A trap grabs them by the heel. A snare holds them tight. A noose lies hidden on the ground. A rope is stretched across their path. Terrors surround the wicked and trouble them at every step. Hunger depletes their strength and calamity waits for them to stumble. Disease eats their skin. Death devours their limbs. They are torn from the security of their homes and are brought down to the king of terrors. The homes of the wicked will burn down. Burning sulfur rains on their houses. Their roots will dry up and their branches will wither. All memory of their existence will fade from the earth. No one will remember their names. They will be thrust from the light into darkness, driven from the world. They will have neither children nor grandchildren, nor any survivor in the place where they lived. People in the West are appalled at their fate. People in the East are horrified. They will say, this was the home of a wicked person, the place of one who rejected God. We turn to Mark 11. Jesus has by now prepared his disciples for his death by prophesying about it and by teaching them about what it will be like to lead in his kingdom. And he healed Bartimaeus, who called Jesus by his messianic title, the Son of David. Mark 11 As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, He told them, Go into that village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, What are you doing? Just say, The Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Praise God in highest heaven! So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went to the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, He left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. 
When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and the teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed the fig tree he had cursed, The disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Believe fully in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Again they entered Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to him. They demanded, By what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? Jesus replied, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? Answer me. They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But we don't dare to say it was merely human, do we? For they were afraid of what the people would do, because everyone in that crowd believed that John was a prophet. So they finally replied, We don't know. And Jesus responded, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. I can remember when I was a young person reading these interchanges between the Jewish leaders and Jesus at the end of his ministry. And I can remember being so impressed with Jesus, and that was the beginning of my following him. And now, let's pray together. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've seen in Jesus today. I thank you for his wisdom in replying to the leaders of his day. And I thank you for the words about prayer and believing that we must believe fully in you in order to receive what we pray for, and we must also forgive those against whom we hold grudges. Father, we pray that you would help us remove all the blocks that block our prayers from being realized. We do believe in you today, and we thank you for answering our prayers. And we pray that you would go with us today, wherever we are, for the glory of Jesus.